Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. His mother's name was Jechaliah. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. He sought God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. As long as he sought the Lord, he, or God gave him success. He went to war against the Philistines and broke down the walls of Gath, Jabna, and Ashdod. He then rebuilt towers near Ashdod and elsewhere among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabs who lived in Ger, Bala, and against the Mayunites. The Am Ammonites brought tribute to Uzziah, and his fame spread as far as the border of Egypt because he had become very powerful. Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate, and at the angle of the wall, and he fortified them. He also built towers in the wilderness and dug many cisterns because he had much livestock in the foothills and in the plain. He had people working his fields and vineyards in the hills and in the fertile lands, for he loved the soil. Uzziah had a well-trained army ready to go out by divisions according to their numbers as mustered by Jael, the secretary, and Maasiah, the officer under the direction of Hananiah, one of the royal officials. The total number of the family leaders over the fighting men was 2,600. Under their command was an army of 307,500 men trained for war, a powerful force to support the king against his enemies. Uzziah provided shields, spears, helmets, coats of armor, bows, and sling stones for the entire army. In Jerusalem, he made the devices invented for use on the towers and on the corner defenses so that soldiers could shoot arrows and hurl large stones from the walls. His fame spread far and wide, for he was greatly helped until he became powerful. But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God, and he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of, <clears throat> of incense. Azariah the priest with eight other courageous priests of the Lord followed him in. They confronted King Uzziah and said, It is not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. This is for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense. Leave the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful, and you will not be honored by the Lord God. Uzziah, who had a censer in his hand ready to burn incense, became angry. While he was raging at the priest in their presence before the incense altar in the Lord's temple, leprosy broke out on his forehead. When Azariah, the chief priest, and all the other priests looked at him, they saw that he had leprosy on his forehead. So they hurried him out. Indeed, he himself was eager to leave because the Lord had afflicted him. King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, leprous and banned from the temple of the Lord. Jotham, his son, had charge of the palace and governed the people of the land. It's not how you start, but it's how you finish. So here we are. It's a new year. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. You don't just want a successful year. You want a successful life. And the word success could be different for all of us, but what I know about success or whatever you determine success looks like is I know if you want to get it, it's not how you start. It's not just how you start. Starting is important, but it's how you finish. All you have to do is think about the tortoise and the hare. Remember that story? The tortoise teaches us it's not just about how you start. It's about how you finish. All you have to do is ask Apple computers that almost went bankrupt in 1998, which is now maybe the largest company, if not one of the top five largest companies in the world. All you have to do is ask them. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. All you have to do is ask Oprah Winfrey, who was fired from her first job in television within a year. A lot of 
not so good reasons around that, but then eventually she landed on at the worst rated AM daytime show in Chicago. And now she's probably the most popular and wealthy daytime host ever. Just ask her. It's not just how you start. It's how you finish. Just a few weeks ago, I, I really enjoy watching football, and I watched a post-game celebration in the locker room. They give all these bird's-eye views, and the Seahawks just beat the Eagles, and I was watching the 70-plus-year-old coach who has won a Super Bowl before. I watched him get so animated. It was super inspiring to me, but he, he essentially was shouting to his team, it's is the game won in the first quarter? And they yelled at him, no. Is the game won in the second quarter? I mean, you gotta imagine 70-something-year-old man jumping around with these 20-something-year-old men. Is the game won in the third quarter? And they shout at him, no. And then he says, is the game won in the fourth quarter? And the entire locker room goes nuts because they just won in the fourth quarter. Just ask them. It's not just how you start, it's how you finish. So what does a successful year look like for you? For lots of us, we might be trying to get our faith back on track. It slipped a little bit and we want, we want to get it back on track. Maybe you're hoping to, have, to continue to have thriving relationships or maybe there's some relationships you want to improve. Maybe you have some health goals. Maybe you have some professional goals. What I do know, and what you probably heard by now at least somewhere, is 92% of New Year's resolutions fail. Why? Because it's not just how you start. It's about how to finish. Most of us don't finish. We, we start, but we lack the ability to be steadfast. And that's the title of this series. The reason why we don't finish, the reason why we don't stick with things, the reason why we don't get our faith back on track is because we struggle being steadfast. Now this series, actually this word really, began surfacing in my heart when I read two different things. The first thing I read was a comment about King David. You know King David, the one who slayed Goliath, which we'll read that in a second. But this verse also jumped out to me several days ago, and I want to read it to you. It's about King Jotham. We just read a long you know, story about his father, King Uzziah, and at the end, Jotham took over for him. And I want, I want to read to you about Jotham, just one verse. Second Chronicles 27, 6 says, Jotham grew powerful, successful, because he walked steadfastly before the Lord, his God. Jotham was steadfast. What does that word mean? We don't really use that word anymore, but in the Hebrew, it's the word kun, which means to be firm, to be unmovable, to, to be established, to be fixed securely, or to direct your efforts and your attention and your whole life in a direction. You might say he was faithful, he was faithful. This verse could also be translated like this. He was careful to live in obedience to the Lord, his God. Or he ordered his ways before the Lord, his God. Or he prepared his ways before the Lord, his God. Or he directed his ways before the Lord, his God. Either way you slice it, Jotham was steadfast. And because he stayed firm, because he knew it wasn't just about how you start, it's about how you finish, he grew strong. He was successful because he was steadfast daily. That's who he was. He was faithful. He was careful to order first and direct all of his ways before the Lord his God. That's what Jotham did. That's what set him apart. And so that's the verse that I've just been hanging on to, just thinking, man, I wish I could just replace my name for, for, for Jotham. That would be success for me, you know? A quote that I read in a commentary uh, researching some verses about King David, uh, John Goldingay wrote this, and it just, it's really stuck with me, and, and I think it'll stick with you. Here's what he said. David's first moments, remember David, highly successful, always following the Lord. The David's first moments, his first moments, when he, great, you know, when he comes onto the pages of the Bible, his first moments 
are also his best moments because later in his life, he makes some bad decisions. He doesn't can always walk steadfastly before the Lord his God. And so I've thought about these, this verse and this comment on King David, and, 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 I've, and I've been thinking to myself, Lord, please don't let my first moments be my best moments. Please don't let that happen. Please don't let the beginning of my faith journey also be the most passionate I ever am about Jesus. Please don't let the first few years of husbandhood be the most devoted I am to my wife. Please don't let the first few years of fatherhood be the the years that I have the most energy for my kids. Please don't let my first moments be my best moments and my character and my leadership and my pastoring. God, may I never start fast and not finish well. Not that I've started fast in every area of my life, but I, you know, I just read these comments and I just, I think to myself, it's like, it's like, you know, success, what is that? It's being steadfast. May I be the dad and the friend and the husband and the Christ follower. May I be able to maintain a steadfast daily walk and a daily pursuit amid the challenges of life, the difficulties of the world, the weight of pastoring, all the things that you could think of that make walking steadfast hard. God, may my last moments, if not be equal to, but be better than my first moments. Maybe you started fast and you want to keep it rolling. Or maybe you've had a bad start a rough start, a slow start, a stumbling start. Maybe as you've gotten a few years of parenting under your belt, the parenting journey has gotten harder because it requires more selflessness. Maybe the marriage got off to a rocky start. Maybe in your faith journey, you were consistent and then you weren't. Maybe you're on a journey to to have purity. And as you try to to grasp that in a world that tells you not to, you've stumbled a little bit. There's been a blemish on your record because the desires and the temptations of young adult life is just, is there, or adult life for that matter. Maybe you had all these plans for retirement. You were gonna be more present with your grandkids or you were gonna get more involved in ministry. And so far, the beginning of retirement hasn't went how you projected. So how do we ensure that our best moments, that my best moments are not are also my most present moments? That's steadfast. That's success. How do we get that and keep it and stay steadfast towards the things that we want to be true? And I'll just say it again. It's not just how you start It's also how you finish. If you want to have a steadfast faith, it's not just how you start. If you want to have good health, it's not just how you start. If you want to achieve your goals, you have to learn to finish. And King Uzziah, Jotham's dad, he started fast. He was king at 16, and he was incredibly successful. We read about it. Year over year, he was a winner. He won war after war after war. He was a builder. He built cities and towns and armies. He was a provider. He created a great national climate for his kingdom. He was an innovator for his armies and his people. He was powerful. 2 Chronicles 26.5 says, As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. Success was happening in King Uzziah's life as he was walking with, thinking about most, and prioritizing the Lord his God first. Uzziah started fast, but then something happened. What happened? Verse 15 and 16, his fame spread far, 2 Chronicles 26, and wide, for he was greatly helped until... He became powerful, successful. But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride, his pride led to his downfall. 
what happened? His early success, his quick start, it developed into something very dangerous. Pride. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So in other words, as we look at King Uzziah's life, pride is the prerequisite in every single fall and every stop and every, you know, step back and every, it's every reason why we don't stay steadfast is because pride works its way in. What is pride? There's a lot of ways we can define it, but I'm going to define it like this today. Pride is an overconsciousness of who you are, what you can do. It's an inflated trust in the self. It's beyond a confidence, if you will. It it means that you probably have a little bit more of an entitlement thing going on for you. It's a false or a heightened view of yourself compared to everybody else. The rules don't apply to you like they apply to everybody else. And a lot of times when we get success, this thing called pride starts to come into us. See, he was doing well until pride took the lead. And where did pride lead? Where it always leads? To a fall. Chapter 26, verse 21 says, King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, leprous and banned from the temple of the Lord. Jotham, his son, had charge of the palace and governed the people. You see, pride separated him. It pulled him away. It it was was an unaligning effect in his life. He wanted success. He was powerful. But when pride came in, it took him off that path for the the, the rest of his life. He started fast. But remember, it's not just about how you start. It's about how you finish. Are you going to be steadfast? That's the difference between holding on to success or letting it go. If you're going to be successful, if you're going to stay with it, if you're going to you know, take the next step in your faith journey, if you're, if you're really going to get it right this time, if you want to ensure that your best moments are your most present moments, then you and I are going to need to do something that King Uzziah could not do, but he had the opportunity to do, and we see it in the text that we read today. And 2 Chronicles 26, 16 through 18 says, He was unfaithful to the Lord, his God, and he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Azariah, the priest with 80 other courageous priests of the Lord, followed him in. They confronted King Uzziah and said, It's not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. This is for the priests. This spiritual act was not something he was assigned to do by the Lord. And yet he gets it in his mind that he should be able to do this. That is for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense. Leave the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful, and you will not be honored by the Lord God. So what happened here? Something happened inside of Uzziah to think, I should be able to do what I'm not permitted to do. Because the rules don't apply to me. Because I'm successful. And I can bend this here and still get to my successful outcome, and still maintain my powerful status. You see, God allows Uzziah to do and have so many things, but this task of, you know, offering the incense which represented the prayers to God was not one of the tasks that God had assigned for him to do. And I don't imagine that Uzziah woke up one day in the middle of his success and said, hey, this is the day. This is the day I'm going to throw everything away. See, this decision to go into the temple to burn incense, this is my assumption, I think it had a little bit of time to to incubate. He had some time to, you know, massage his own ego and come up with all the reasons and the self-messaging as to why he should be able to do this thing that he was not permitted to do. And very similarly, most of us quit 
Most of us make big mistakes, not in a moment, but in a series of moments where we allow self-talk and self-justification that's shaped by pride to fuel what we will or what we will not do or what we'll stop doing or what we'll continue to do and the consequences won't be real. That's pride. See, we think, sort of like Uzziah thought, I will never be conceited like that to throw everything away if I just, you know, bend the rules a little bit here. That's not how it works. You see, conceit works through self-deceit. Every time. Here's how I know this. Because pride lies behind every mistake you've ever made. And it lies to you. And it tells you that it was okay for you to do that. It lists a whole bunch of reasons. Think about it. Before you did that stupid thing, what led you there? Pride. I should be able to do this. Other people are doing this. I've earned this. They should do what I think they should do. Before you stopped doing that good thing, what led you to quit? Pride. I don't need to do that anymore. I'm fine. I don't need to exercise. Everything will get better on its own. I don't need to have a daily devotion with the Lord to be close to him. What is that? That's pride. Behind your struggling marriage, your failed goals, your back and forth with God, what's behind all that? Pride. And conceit works through self-deceit. See, the reason why is pride. The reason why you've neglected to go get counseling is because of pride. The reason why you struggle with receiving feedback, whether it's from your wife or a coworker or a child, is because of pride. The reason why you're not fully honest with them all the time is because of pride. The reason why you haven't started that yet is because of pride. The reason why you're a people pleaser is because of pride. The reason why you care so much about what they think and it affects what you do and how you carry yourself is pride. The reason why your faith is not a priority, the reason why attendance is, you know, if I have time that weekend to church, the reason why you're not plugged in, the reason why you don't think you need to add disciplines is because you think you're fine. That's pride. The, the reason why your health habits fail is because you think it's a cheat day, but really what you're doing is you're saying, I can eat and live and sleep however I want because I'm not really in that bad of shape and this little thing won't do anything. It's pride. The reason why people start well and they don't finish and they don't stay steadfast is because of pride. So here we are, everybody. We want to be successful. We want to seek the Lord. You want to have a strong faith. You want to love your spouse unconditionally. You want to be able to put your kids above yourself. You want to be able to accomplish your goals. What are you going to need to do? You're going to need to do what King Uzziah could not do and did not do. If you want to stay steadfast, there's no other way than this. You have to confront your conceit. You have to confront it. You have to address it. You have to talk about it. Did you notice when King Uzziah acted in pride? Did you notice the 80 priests that saw his pride and they confronted him? That's what it's going to take. What is confronting? Confronting is when you bring to consciousness an error or a lie or a problem. And pride is trying to, you know, put that underneath our consciousness, because we have an inflated consciousness of who we are and what we can do and what we should be able to get away with. And, and confronting is saying, no, 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 no. We are going to bring this above the surface and we are going to talk about this. And they confronted him. And the priests, if you, if you look at the text, they did so plainly. They didn't beat around the bush. Lovingly, they had his best in mind. They used truth, so they weren't making stuff up. And they, they, they were for him. And in order for them to confront him, think about the courage. He's the most powerful man in their nation. And they are confronting him. You need courage if you're going to confront pride in your life. Courage is the ability to do something frightening. If you want to be steadfast, you have to have the courage to be exposed like that. To be honest with yourself like that. To be real about where you're really at. 
to be real about what's really going on inside of yourself. You will never stay steadfast unless you have the courage to confront pride and to be brutally honest with yourself. If you want to stay steadfast, you have to confront the conceit. And there's three confrontations that you're going to need to be able to make to address this pride problem so you don't go and lead your life into a fall or your faith into a fall or your marriage continues to nosedive. You have to address the pride. The first thing you have to do is you have to have the courage to do so. You have to have the courage to confront the presence of pride, this is so important, that hasn't presently arrived This is so important. And this is why pride gets in, because it's very, very sneaky. What do I mean? I mean that our fall or our mistakes or your mess ups or your quitting or your step backs or your inconsistencies, all of that starts inside of you before it manifests into real life. Let's look at 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. This is the important part. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of the Lord, God lives forever. As long as he sought the Lord, he had success. It's not just how you start, it's how you finish. And what do we learn from this text? We learn that pride always starts in the flesh before it ever gets expressed. It's it's always being nurtured and sown and grown in your heart and in your mind before it actually takes a hold of your will and you do what it says. And so here's the question we have to ask. And this is why I say we have to confront the presence before it becomes present. How is pride hiding in you? What privately are you battling? What are you lusting after? What are you wanting in your flesh? What are you justifying in your self-talk? What what are you, com- you know, desiring in your human nature to do that maybe you're not permitted to do? But you keep thinking, I could do this. I should be able to do this. It'll be fine if I do this. You see, it takes courage for us right here, right now, to say, I'm really struggling with thinking about doing X. We've got to confront the pride before it becomes reality. And if you don't have your handle on the temptations of your soul, and if you're not confronting them, then you might just be harboring them and feeding them, and you don't even realize it. See, every, everything we do, it starts in the flesh, and then it gets acted out in real life. And so we have to be able to say, you know what? I am struggling with this. You know, affairs, what does Jesus say? Affairs start in the heart, in the flesh. Faith erodes in the flesh. We stop doing what's good for us because we actually want something else instead. It's pride. And it's in there. And what we have to do is we have to admit it. We have to confess it to the Lord. We maybe need to tell somebody else, but whatever you do, don't let it stay under the surface in the subconscious. Don't wait until it's too late because the damage it could do if we don't bring it up, if we ignore it, if we soothe it away, if we think it's not an issue, what it's gonna do, the same thing it did to King Uzziah, it's gonna separate you from your success. It's gonna separate you from your finish. It's going to mean you will not be steadfast if you do not confront the breeding ground of pride in your heart. It's not just how you start, it's how you finish. And we need to confront pride. We need to have the courage to confront it. The second confrontation we need to make is you need to have the courage to believe that it's not too late to correct the conceit. Because sometimes 
we don't correct it in the heart and it does come out and we do make a poor decision or we do act rashly or we do something that we shouldn't do or we stop something that we should keep doing. And Uzziah is confronted. They're like, you should not be here. This is not for you. You're about to burn incense. This is the priest's job. What made you think you could get away with doing this? You see, they're confronting him. But, but the, the king, he could have let that correction replant him into a steadfast walk. But what did he do? He, the text says in, in 2 Chronicles 26, 19 through 20, that he raged on. See, Uzziah, who had the censer in his hand, ready to burn the incense, he's ready to act. He became angry when he was called out. While he was raging at the priests in their presence before the incense altar in the Lord's temple, what happened? Leprosy broke out on his forehead. When Azariah, the chief priest, and all the other priests looked at him, they saw that he had leprosy on his forehead, which, by the way, when you're acting like that, everybody else can see it. And they all saw it. They saw it as all, as, you know, becoming present on him. They saw that he had leprosy on his forehead, so they hurried him out because he was not to be unclean in the temple of the Lord. He himself, is so interesting, was eager to leave. That's quite the difference because he was just as eager to burn the incense a few moments before that because the Lord had afflicted him. We need the courage to believe it's not too late to correct the conceit. And see, what happens with Uzziah here as he chooses to continue in this false reality about himself when he's confronted? He scoffs at it. His pride enlarges. I should be able to do this. And what's actually happening, we see this on the outside, but on the inside, there's also another internal assault going on as he's being corrected. You see, pride is boasting in him. And here's what he's thinking. It's too embarrassing for me to humble myself in this confrontation. See, pride leads us to a choice. Bear the embarrassment or bear the separation. And Uzziah decides, I can't live in the reality that I've messed up, that I was wrong, and that I need to learn, and I need to go back to my place. He could not admit that. Do you know who I am? I'm the powerful Uzziah. I've had success year after year after year. The short-term humility was more painful for him to experience than the humiliation of long-term pride. And we all look at that and we go, well, obviously the long-term humiliation is, worth, is worse. But he, he does not realize in the moment, it's not just how you start, it's how you finish. Now, perhaps you are here today, and there's a metaphorical sensor in your hand, you know? There's something you think you should do, something you think you should be getting away with, something you think you could get away with and still achieve your goals and still achieve your success and still have a strong faith with God and still steadfastly finish this life, and, and you have a sensor in your hand, you know? And what you do next could make or break your marriage, what you do next could make or break your reputation. What you do next could separate you from the success that you're trying to get by doing that thing. And we have to understand, we have to have the courage to confront the conceit. What happens when, we, when pride manifests itself in us and we realize that we've made a mistake, like Uzziah, we're eager to leave, we're eager to withdraw, we're eager to hide, to stop, to quit, to give up, because we don't want to face the truth. And then we start to feel defeated, like a failure. He spent the rest of his life separated from his family and his kingdom and his responsibilities because of this moment. I'm here today to tell somebody it's not over. You might have stepped off the path. You might be holding a sensor in your hand ready to do something you shouldn't. You, you might have become full of yourself. You might have made some poor decisions already. 
you might have let pride lead you so far or already this year, I'm here to say, if you confront that pride, you might be able to get your marriage back. You might be able to restore that relationship. You might be able to walk steadfastly before the Lord. You might be able to restart. But you can't unless you confront and have the courage to confront your pride. As a young man, Uzziah was hungry to learn. He was teachable and humble. Look at verse 4 of chapter 26. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. See, when he was humble, it led to successful. When he valued the Lord's eyes, when he had the posture of a heart that says, I need to learn. I don't know very much. I'm a student. Please teach me. When, when he approached life in a humble spirit, it led to success. And if you are humbled, you're in a good place to reclaim your start and to finish stead. Fastly. Now, I can remember when I was about 19 years old, just came to faith, and I can remember thinking about the first, you know, several years of young adulthood for me. And the easiest way to say it is I completely botched the first part of my life because of pride. And I can remember sitting in that guilt and the humility of my terrible decisions, uh, the emotional wreck that I was because of those decisions, but also the, the, the health impact, the spiritual and physical health impact that I had in my life because I, I had made all of these poor decisions. I can remember nothing feeling worse than the humiliation of your own doing. And I can remember thinking, maybe like some of you, will I ever get back what I lost? Will I, uh, seriously, will I ever get married? Because so far I've not handled relationships well. Will I ever be forgiven? Because some of the things I had done were not so good. Will I ever be able to forgive myself? I remember thinking about my new faith and, and wondering, will God really give someone like me success? Can I actually be fixed? Because I'm broken and I've made a mess of things. As I think back to that and I think back to it now, that's humility. It's not how you, just how you start. You need to have a humble start. But it's how you finish. And if you want to finish, you need to confront the pride that is not necessarily obvious in your life. If you want to finish, you need to be able to believe it's not too late to correct where you've messed up. And how you can believe that is the last confrontation. You need to have the courage to let his grace fuel your finish. You need to have a confrontation with the Lord. And you need to let his grace come into your life. How are you going to finish? How are you going to stay steadfast? How are you going to have success? The truth is, not by yourself. Not because of yourself. You see, Uzziah storms into the temple thinking he can do all the spiritual things in addition to the other things God had given him to do out of pride. But they weren't assigned to him. The truth is, you cannot walk steadfastly or faithfully before the Lord your God all on your own ability. You need grace to fuel your finish. Pride tempts us to think that we can be steadfast and we can sustain and we can be successful all on our own, all with our own wits and learnings because we have experience, because we're intelligent, because we're powerful. 
but grace needs to fuel your finish. And that seems kind of discouraging to say in a series called Steadfast, you can't be steadfast on your own. But follow me for another minute. You see, there was another king who started young and fast. He was born of a virgin, and he is written about as being 100% God and 100% human. He was God incarnate. He was sent to rescue us from our sin. And as he grew up into adulthood, the scriptures say he grew in wisdom and in stature and favor with God and people. He grew powerful. And he delivered powerful teachings and he turned water into wine and he healed diseases and he cast out demons. Ultimately, the king that I'm talking about that started young and fast is Jesus. And Jesus came in humility because you and I fell, because our pride led. You see, we started well, but then we stopped faithfully following God, every single one of us. And Luke records a fascinating statement in Luke 9, 51. Here's what it says. At the time, as the time approached for him, Jesus, to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. It's as if Jesus is saying, Jesus had a great start to his ministry, to his purpose. And now he was faced with the finish, Jerusalem, suffering, the cross, a humble death, his life for ours. And what does he do? The text says he resolutely sets out or he sets his face or he became firm. See, Jesus was steadfast, even when it cost him. He was steadfast in his humility. He put the Lord first in everything he did. He put his love for you first. And he grew the most powerful and the most renowned because he was the most humble and the most selfless. Jesus walked steadfastly and perfectly before the Lord. And because he did, and only because he did, can you finish. You will not, I will not walk steadfastly before the Lord if it wasn't for Jesus confronting my sin problem my pride issue, and covering me with grace that I don't deserve. And you cannot have his finish. You cannot have it. He wants to give it to you. He wants to give you his steadfastness this year. He wants to give you his steadfastness in your marriage. He wants to give you his steadfastness in the struggle you're in right now against sin. But you can't have it unless you have the courage to confront your pride. Unless you become humble And you start every day with this kind of statement. I need a savior. I need someone. I need someone to walk before me. I need to walk before the Lord and I need him to go first. Because if I'm left to myself, I will step off the path because I will become conceited. We have to to have a humble understanding that We don't know very much. And we're not as strong as we think we are. And we should not be able to do whatever we want. We need to be humble enough to say, okay, I need your grace to confront my pride so I can finish. And when we do, somebody hear me, it's so freeing when you realize you don't have to make it all on your own. That Jesus himself is your finish. That if you let his grace confront your worst self, that you can be free and you no longer have to walk in a artificial consciousness about who you are and maintain that your whole life. You can walk in a full consciousness that you are loved, that you are forgiven, that you can be made new. And most of all, you can finish because Jesus finished the race for you and for me. It's not just how you start. It's also how you finish. How are you going to be steadfast this year? Will you have the courage to confront pride? Will you be able to say, I need you, Lord. I need you. Will you be able to say, 
Jesus, you're gonna be my finish and my heart is yours. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you've never given your heart to Jesus. And when I talk about the shame and the guilt and the, the pressure of trying to be successful all on your own, you, you, hear, you hear that and, and you want relief from that. And the only relief is when you come to a place in your life and you say, I need a relationship with you. I need you to go before me. Help me to know what it means to have a relationship with you. And maybe you're here today and that's how you need to start this year off. Maybe you're here today and you need to reaffirm that that's how you're going to get where you wanna go. It's only through the humble ground of coming to Jesus and saying, lead me. Lead me this year. Help me to walk steadfastly before you, not just at the beginning, but at the end. Let's pray together. God, I wanna thank you so much for your grace. Your grace gives me the courage to confront my own pride and my own problems and my own shortcomings. Your grace frees me. It frees us. The truth sets us free. And I pray over everyone's year in this room. I pray for victory and struggles. I pray for restored marriages. I pray for renewed relationships. I pray for a room full of people that will grow powerful because they walk steadfastly before you every day. God, my heart is yours. I need you in my life. Lead me, lead me, lead me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, would you stand? Let's sing.